I think our world and our, our country especially are addicted to violence and war as a way of solving problems. And uh, that's a very, very expensive <laughs> way of living. Uh, 180 million people died in the last century from wars. And uh, it's now 80% of the people that are dying in wars are civilians. They're not the people with the guns. And yet we keep fighting the wars. And there are actually <laughs> alternatives. I mean, the wars aren't working. We're getting further and further in the hole. Uh, even General McChrystal said, uh, we're creating more enemies than we're killing you know, through our drone strikes. Well, a lot of people are very discouraged. <laughs> what can we do? And uh, I have written this book, Waging Peace, Global Adventures of a Lifelong Activist. And if uh, some of you either uh, buy this book or borrow <laughs> Ann's book or something like that, uh, you'll see the photos that I was going to show tonight uh, together with the stories. Um, but I had the good fortune of meeting Martin Luther King when I was 15 years old in Montgomery, Alabama. And that introduced me to uh, nonviolence as a way of trying to resolve conflict. And uh, I've been at it ever since um, in this country and many countries around the world. Um, so what I'm going to do is just share, and I, I've shared these stories because I want people to feel hopeful. You know, the, the individuals, small groups of people can make a difference. So um, they went, I went to Howard University, which was an African-American university in Washington, D.C., and I happened to be there in February of 1960 when four African-American students in Greensboro, North Carolina uh, had had it with segregation and went to, to a drugstore to get something to eat. Instead of getting something to eat, they were arrested. And, uh, and that happened. That was a spark that encouraged especially African-American students all over the South to begin going, challenging segregation in their own communities. So... Um, at Howard University, which is mostly African-American students, we found out that in both Maryland and Virginia, everything was segregated. Even African ambassadors could not eat along the highway between New York and uh, Washington in the state of Maryland. So we started, uh, we did nonviolence training. We started going to Maryland to get something to eat. And uh, we invariably, they would close the lunch counters and arrest us. And we spent our weekends, most of my weekends in my sophomore year in college, in jail uh, for trying to get something to eat. Well, the state of Virginia had passed a law saying anybody that challenged segregation there could get um, six months in jail and $500 fines. So all that spring, we kept going to Maryland uh, for reasons you can guess. Well, um, when, it, when we'd finished our final exams in June, uh, of 1960, still nobody had challenged that law. The American Nazi Party were down there uh, threatening violence to people. We did additional nonviolence training and felt somebody has to challenge this law. So we went to what was called a people's drugstore, but it wasn't <laughs> really a people's drugstore because they didn't serve black people. So uh, we sat down at the lunch counter and they closed the lunch counter as usual but the manager didn't want us arrested, so we waited for two days to get something to eat. And it was the most challenging two days of my life. Uh, people spat at us in the face. People put lit cigarettes down our, our shirts. People punched us in the stomach so hard we would fall on the floor. And each time something like this happened, we tried to be nonviolent. <laughs> and try to love these people that were doing this to us. The American Nazi Party even came with their swastikas. Well, toward the end of the second day, I was uh, reflecting on loving your enemies, and I heard this guy come up from behind me, and he says, if you don't get out of the store in two seconds, I'm going to stab this through your heart. And in his hand was a switchblade. Wow. And I looked at his face, and I saw this, this knife right here, 
And I thought, I have two seconds to decide what to do. And I just uh, looked at him in the eyes, in a face that was contorted with hatred, and I said, well, friend, do what you believe is right, but I'll still try to love you. And uh, miraculously, this jaw, his jaw began to fall, and his knife that was like this began to fall, and he left the store which for a young 20-year-old was kind of an amazing experience about the power of nonviolence. Well, uh, we then uh, wrote a statement appealing to the community leaders of Arlington, Virginia to get their eating facilities open to everyone and said, if nothing changes, in a week we'll be back. And that was very hard to say, <laughs> we'll be back. Uh, news people, friendly news people got us out alive and we uh, got back to Howard and little, literally shook for six days whether we had the courage to go back and do this again. And on the sixth day, we had a, a phone call from the religious and community leaders of Arlington that they had met and talked with the business leaders and uh, got a promise that the eating facilities would be open to everyone within 10 days. So I like to think this was the most important lesson of my life, uh, that we don't have to just curse the television set or the president or segregation or war. We can find some other people that believe as deeply as we do about something, uh, get, you know, do some studying of nonviolence, and go and challenge it uh, head on. So we can help make history. So that's... Uh, more important than anything else I learned in college or maybe ever since. So um, instead of six months in jail, I got, to, uh, got a scholarship to go to Europe and spent a year in Berlin. And 1960-61, the United States and the Soviet Union were threatening nuclear war over Berlin. And I'd studied German in college, but Berlin was the one place in the world I could live in both worlds. <laughs> uh, and just try to understand why are we willing to kill hundreds of millions of people because we're right and they're wrong. And <laughs> similarly, uh, from their perspective, and how do we solve these problems peacefully? Well, I studied at the universities out of East and West Berlin, bicycled through Checkpoint Charlie where American tanks were on one side and the Soviet tanks on the other side you know, facing each other and um, heard a lot of communist propaganda in East Berlin at the university, and I challenged that propaganda, and they called me a capitalist warmonger. And I came back to the West in the afternoon and uh, heard a lot of anti-communist propaganda, and I challenged that, and they called me a communist conspirator. So I, I learned early on that, unfortunately, our governments uh, have a lot of influence on the people. You know, I mean, what, I don't know if you want to call it brainwashing or getting into the mentality of we're the good guys <laughs> and they're the bad guys and we've got to kill them or be ready to kill them uh, or even drop an atom bomb on them and, you know, millions of people that have nothing to do with, uh, with you know, peace, w w nothing to do with uh, hating the enemy. They're just, uh, they happen to live there. Well, <clears throat> I did things like getting students from both sides to, you know, to come together and, and uh, talk and get to know each other. Well, I then heard you could go to Russia uh, on a camping trip, and this was before citizen diplomacy. And I thought, oh, that's, well, we should do that. I want to get to know these people that are the enemy. So um, I got... I, borrowed some money for a VW bug, and five of us traveled 5,000 miles through the Soviet Union, just getting to know ordinary people. Wow. And um, you, I, in my book, I've got a photo of just some of these Russian people and their beautiful, smiling faces. And I say, you can tell if you look at them that they are evil communists. <laughs> you know? These are the people that we you know, have to be ready to, to kill. Well, uh, we didn't believe that, of course. And um, I led three groups of students in the early 60s uh, on those trips. Well, I had, uh, together with a couple other Quakers, uh, we, that spring we had uh, had a silent 
vigil in front of the White House praying for an end to nuclear weapons testing. We're still doing above ground testing. And uh, people came and says, why are you demonstrating against our peaceful bombs? Go to, the, go to Russia and demonstrate there. Well, I was in Russia later that summer and uh, the Soviets, of course, also had responsibility <laughs> for bomb testing. So with another fellow that was in our group, uh, we had a sign saying bomb test kill people and uh, started a vigil in front of the Kremlin in Red Square. Well, the people came up and says, why are you demonstrating against our peaceful bombs when you go to the United States? And we explained, well, we'd already demonstrated in the United States and they told us to go to Russia. The police came and threatened us with 20 years in prison for, uh, uh, I think they called, what was it they charged? We would be charged with uh, criminal conspiracy and, you know. Well, we thought about that for a moment and said, well, thank you for warning us, but if uh, this arms race continues, you know, hundreds of millions of us are going to be dead. And then 20 years in prison wouldn't be as bad as that. And we already demonstrated in the United States and <laughs> are appealing to all the governments. They said, well, we have to talk to our superiors and uh, left and, um, and never came back. So luckily we didn't have to spend 20 years in prison. Um, also that spring we had a chance to, to uh, six Quakers had a chance to meet with President Kennedy for about 40 minutes in the White House. I was the young guy, <laughs> 21 years old. Uh, and uh, we were talking about the nuclear arms race. How can we uh, move away from this, area, this place where we're about to destroy each other uh, to a place we can live in peace in the world? And uh, he says, you know, I've been reading uh, the book, The Guns of August. And everybody was arming to the teeth before the First World War to try to prevent getting into that war. And that was exactly what got us all into that war. And it's scary how similar the situation was then to what it is now, 1962. Well, uh, I said, Mr. President, uh, we would like to encourage you to challenge the Russians to a peace race. You know, we've had an arms race, <laughs> atom bomb, hydrogen bomb, neutron bomb. Uh, let's, let's go the other direction. And he says, if you're serious about this, the military industrial complex is very strong in this country and um, you need to organize a much more powerful movement to enable me to take that kind of leadership. Well, um, after half an hour, his secretary came and said, Mr. President, your next appointment is here. And, um, and he said, tell them to wait. I'm learning something from these Quakers, which was you know, kind of interesting. Well, he had his marching orders, and we had ours uh, in terms of our, our work to do. Well, um, one of the uh, stories I'd like to share, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stories in the book, probably more than 100. <laughs> so I'll just be sharing several of them. But uh, during the Vietnam War, the American, it took uh, you know, American people a long time to wake up. <laughs> I mean, we were lied to <laughs> about why you know, we had to be in that war. And, um, and, it, and, you know, what, by the end, there's about 3 million Vietnamese that died, you know, and there were 58,000 Americans. Well, we, uh, a bunch of us started reading the names of the war dead on the Capitol steps. And um, the Capitol Police didn't like it, and so, oh, yeah. so they arrested us. Yeah. We'd do it on Wednesday noon at lunchtime. And um, that would happen every Wednesday. And after about three weeks, I went to Congressman George Brown from Southern California and said, Congressman, is there anything you can do to help us? Because I knew he was also concerned about the war. And he said, yeah, he says, I think I will join you. Wow. So the next, and he says, and I will write to every member of Congress inviting them to join us as well. So the next day, we had, um, we, 
we had all the rest of us reading the names of the war dead and three members of Congress. So when the rest of us were all arrested, the three members of Congress had congressional immunity and they continued reading for you know, the whole 30,000 or so Americans that had died in the war. That got in the congressional record and it was on television set. And within two weeks, uh, Life magazine had a photo of every American who had died in the war, uh, together with where they went to school, uh, what branch of the, the military they'd been part of, and where they died. And within weeks, people were reading the names of the war dead at their congressional offices, at uh, federal buildings, at post offices all across the United States. So I like to think our courage gave courage to these members of Congress <laughs> to do something more than what they'd been doing. And their courage, you know, kind of brought this issue into the public and, you know, millions of people across the country started uh, doing more. Well, in Christmas of 1971, the United States started bombing Hanoi and Haiphong. And uh, these, these were cities where millions of people lived. I mean, you know, it looks like Boston, you know, as far as, and I was just there a year ago. But um, Christmas time, the time we talk about peace and, you know, <laughs> uh, loving one another, et cetera. And here we start bombing cities of millions of people. Well, we were living in a community in West Philadelphia, and this was just so painful. And we decided we had to come together and really feel at a heart level what this is about and what can we do to try to stop it. Well, we, um, we had a meeting for worship. Not everybody was Quakers, but we just tried to feel what it was like for the parents that lived under those bombs to know that their children might not be alive tomorrow. They might not be, as parents might not be alive. And to hear bombs dropping all around them. And then we tried to look at what, what are we feeling led to do to try to stop this, this madness. And we um, finally decided we have to do, somehow put our bodies between these bombs and the people in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, we'd written letters and we'd, you know, held vigils, <laughs> done all kinds of things. But we had to somehow put our, our bodies in the way of these bombs reaching their destination. So as a community, we could support each other. If some people were killed or spent a long time in jail, others could help pay the rent, help take, I had two young children at the time. Um, we could care, you know, care and support for each other. So it was a joint uh, witness. Well, we found that in uh, Leonardo, New Jersey, there were ships loading with bombs and munitions every week going to Vietnam. And that was easier than going over to Hanoi and Haiphong <laughs> to actually try to get in the way there. So uh, we recruited 22 canoes and uh, 44 people. And we uh, paddled out uh, to, along the ship. There were crates of uh, napalm and anti-personnel bombs being loaded onto the ship. Uh, again, they, they warned us with uh, years in prison. Uh, if we didn't uh, leave the area. And again, we said that would be, um, thanks for warning us, but if these bombs reach their destination, it's going to be worse <laughs> than years in prison. Well, uh, on, this, on the sixth day, we had heard it was leaving very early in the morning, so we were out there before six in the morning paddling to try to stay right in front of the ship. And as they lifted anchor of the ship, uh, we looked up on the, on the bow of this big ship, and there were crates, mass, crates about 15 feet high on the deck of, of these bombs and munitions, and, and of course down in the hold, it was totally filled. And we looked up there, and seven sailors jumped off of the ship into the ocean to join our blockade. And we had called the TV networks and the New York Times. There's a photo in my book a New York Times photo. Um, and they start, these guys started swimming toward our canoes to join our blockade, which uh, was quite an amazing experience. 
Well, they were picked up by the Navy and put back in the brig of the ship, which is like the jail. And, uh, but what they had done was on evening television, uh, it was in the New York Times, and it went out to the military around the world. And uh, they told us that when their ship went through the Panama Canal, uh, all the other Navy ships had heard about the USS Nitro and the sailors that had jumped uh, to join the People's Blockade and gave them the fist of solidarity. So um, about that time, uh, the resistance of American soldiers to uh, carrying out their immoral, illegal orders of, of totally destroying villages uh, began to increase significantly. And if you've seen the film Sir No Sir, uh, you'll know that part of the reason that war ended is the American soldiers were not carrying out their orders anymore. They were not, <laughs> shoot, they, would, they called it uh, search and avoid. <laughs> it's, it's, instead of search and destroy. Yeah. Um, so again, our courage gave these seven sailors some courage to do what they believed was right. And their courage gave lots of other American soldiers that were put in a horrible situation to do something they knew was totally wrong. And, and they'd been lied to. Um, that blockade not only had continued in New Jersey, it went up and down the East Coast and West Coast. And so uh, people for the next eight months were blocking uh, these ships and uh, had to be arrested or you know, towed out of the way. Or uh, in some cases, they would dump our canoes and then frogmen would come and get us and point uh, guns at us, uh, you know, face down on the deck while the ships, you know, s sailed off for Vietnam. Um, well, I, Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab is a place 30, I live in San Francisco, California, and that's one of the places that the United States has been developing nuclear bombs for the last <laughs> since uh, the 40s, I guess. And, um, yeah, the Bay Area is supposedly progressive. <laughs> but here, here we're the place that's developing nuclear bombs. So with the religious community and many others, we've been organizing an ongoing nonviolent campaign to say, this is, this is insane. I mean, nuclear weapons could put a life, end a all life on the planet. And uh, even now, when the United States and the other nuclear powers have committed to abolish all our nuclear weapons, we're spending, a, we've committed to spend a trillion dollars modernizing our nuclear weapons over the next years. Which, so anyway, we're saying from <laughs> ordinary people, let's turn around. And uh, what if we spent the the trillion, it's a trillion dollars every year we're spending on wars and preparations for wars. What if we spent that trillion dollars to try to make a better life for every person on the planet? You know, how much safer we would be. Um, well, these are just uh, some of the stories. Uh, how many of you have heard of the veteran Brian Wilson? Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, came from a uh, Christian anti-communist John Birch Society family and volunteered to go to Vietnam and came back and uh, well and one of his jobs there was to go into the villages and find how effective the bombing had been and he talks about village after village after village uh, it'd be almost all women and children and old men but they'd all be dead and he went into one village, and this woman had had her eyelids burned by napalm. So she was looking right at him. And around her, her body were her children, trying to get comfort from their mother. And uh, they were all dead. But he, he, he just thought, what am I doing 10,000 miles from home, <laughs> doing this to these people? And um, he... Um, it was a conversion experience, and he decided he could not do that anymore. Well, Brian has said, 
our lives as Americans are no, not more important than the people in Vietnam or Central America or other parts of the world. And their lives are not worth less than our lives. And uh, which is a very radical <laughs> way of looking at the world because many Americans have the idea we're more important. You know, and it's all right if we want to bomb their country because we want their oil or uh, we want, it's our right to have six times our share of the world's resources, et cetera. Well, Brian didn't believe that. And um, he was, we were together, we organized something where we were blocking trains carrying bombs to Central America. And uh, you may know his story. He said to the military, you can stop bombing stop shipping bombs to ship. They're going to go to ships to go kill people in Central America. Or, or I, I didn't say, we'll be, with other veterans, I'll be fasting for 40 days on the tracks. And uh, so you can stop, stop the shipment of arms, or you can arrest us, uh, put us in jail, but we want you to know that the moment you're released, we'll be back on the tracks. You know, blocking the trains, or you can run over us. And we never guess, guess that what they would do it or would be to run over us, which is what they did. And his legs were cut off, and um, luckily he survived. Uh, but we continued blocking every train there for two and a half years. And sometimes they would. they didn't run over you? They only ran over you? Oh. Uh, well, it's a longer story. I, I was knocked down. I was. Uh, I was not actually right between the tracks because I'd agreed to do nonviolent training of another group of people, and we were going to block a train later that afternoon. Oh, goodness. But that knocked me down, and so I was right outside the track looking and seeing Brian banged from one side to another. But um, obviously the military was saying, we have a war to fight <laughs> in Central America. This is the 80s, uh, and you guys get out of the way. Well, instead of that, here we blocked every train for two and a half years. And people all around the world heard about Brian and our witness and were so touched that there were Americans that cared so much about this, their suffering and pain that we're willing to risk our lives to try to stop uh, this, their terrible suffering. Well, um, one of the later things I did uh, or have done is to help start the Nonviolent Peace Force that Anne is very involved with. And we have discovered that uh, when people are doing horrible things, <laughs> you know, like beheading people or uh, shooting villagers and uh, making all kinds of things, often endangering human rights workers or peace workers, that if there are international people present, it can make it safer. So. Uh, together with Mel Duncan, uh, he and I, uh, with many others, co-founded the Nonviolent Peace Force. And the vision is that we have hundreds and eventually thousands of trained peacemakers that could go into conflict areas to both protect local peace workers and human rights workers and also civilian populations. Because as I said earlier, 80% of the people dying in wars now are civilians. So um, presently, we have a project in Mindanao in the Philippines, invited by both the Muslim uh, Islamic Liberation Front and the government, uh, where there is a ceasefire, but there are hotheads on either side that would like to get back <laughs> into a fight. And so we are trying to help support that ceasefire moving into a long-term agreement. We're also in Burma, where again, uh, there's been uh, war happening for, for many years. And there's some of the ethnic groups that have made peace with the government. And again, we're trying to um, be an international nonviolent force to try to help, help keep that ceasefire and move it into a longer-term longer peace. And we're in South Sudan, you know, where civilians have been taking the brunt of that whole uh, war. Um, we've got 150 people there, and we've just been invited to go to Syria, uh, to, invited by civil society groups in 
in all parts of Syria and from many, many different religi religious groups. And um, Uh, we're not uh, we're not specifically in Palestine, but uh, Christian peacemaker teams is um, what, the National Council of Churches, uh, and there's a women's encampment from Britain that are uh, I've been in, both in Gaza and in the West Bank and in Israel, and um, as you probably know, uh, in in the West Bank many of the Villagers have been separated by, from the fields, from their fields, uh, by uh, this new wall. And um, every Friday at noon, after prayers at the mosque, uh, they uh, peacefully march to the wall to demand that the wall be removed, or at least <laughs> moved away, so they can get to their fields. And um, unfortunately, the Israeli police uh, almost always uh, start shooting this terrible tear gas. I mean, you can really hardly breathe. And then rubber coat coated bullets and, you know, some people have been killed. Uh, but people are continuing, it's... it's lots, of, lots of Palestinians are being killed every day. Hmm? Lots of Palestinians are being killed every day. Yeah, yeah. And I have a photo in here uh, in Gaza where I visited in 2010. Uh, there was a woman showing us photographs of 28 of her, pa her family members that have been killed. Um, and in her house, uh, which had been bombed, uh, the upper half of the house, there was no cement and because they can't get building materials in. So it was just mud, you know, between the bricks. But, you know, the, imagine the pain of 28 of your family members uh, killed. So um, anyway, uh, in terms of the Nonviolent Peace Force, when we started it, people in the United Nations said, you show that it can work for eight or 10 years, and then we'll do it. Well, I would have preferred for the United Nations to say, this is our job <laughs> to end the scourge of war, <laughs> and, we're, and we'll do it. But they said, you do it for eight or 10 years and show it can work, and then we'll do it. And now we have many UN agencies uh, who are supporting our work. And even European Union countries, uh, the European Union has contributed 5 million euros for this new project in Syria. So they feel bad conscience about, and of course, all the, the, I, I don't know, is it millions of refugees from Syria that are coming to Europe? Well, it's because of the war. Uh, so they're, they say, here are some people actually trying to <laughs> help the civilians in this area. So, um, and UNICEF and UN High Commission for Refugees, et cetera, are supporting our work in various places. But uh, our, our vision, our goal, is that we have thousands of people. And that uh, people, the world can see that nonviolent, un unarmed intervention is much more effective and much less costly, both in human lives and in uh, billions of dollars. Uh, and in instilling hatred, you know, which can con continue for generations. So that's a little bit of a few of the stories that are in my book, but I'd love to hear any questions or comments. Yes? I have a question, very inspiring and painful to listen to. Question about... Uh, You'll forgiving, forgive me for, for being, making it painful for you? I'm a traumatized Pole, so I'm still healing from the Second World War. It seems like <laughs> Pole. <laughs> Pole. Okay. I was born in uh, postal Poland. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you were in the Soviet Union in the 60s traveling, and from what I know, mm -hmm. the, there were so many restrictions on foreigners and where they could move. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to move to these different villages? You, you know, you had to have approval from the authorities. Yeah. So you simply couldn't. Well, um, they, we had to tell them ahead of time where we're going, and there had to, there had to be campgrounds there, which was not just, you know, foreigners. There were many people from you know, Eastern Europe and from, you know, the Soviet Union. Um, so, I mean, we went, 
you know, through Warsaw to Bresk, Minsk, Smolensk, and then south, you know, to the Ukraine and out through Romania and Hungary, et cetera. But um, so we couldn't just go anywhere. Right. Uh, you know, we, we could say we'll be at the campground in, in Moscow for 14 days or however long we, well, not, I think a month was probably as long as we were allowed to be there. But, um, and we had to have a guide two hours a day where we'd go to the museums, et cetera, but then the rest of the time we were <laughs> just talking with people. Were you shadowed by secret? No. But that, I mean, the, the demonstration that we did in Red Square, um, I was not allowed back in the Soviet Union for 26 years. Well, the Soviet Union crumbled, so now you can... Well, they, they cr well uh, I got back before it crumbled. I was there, I'm just another story, it's in my book, when Gorbachev was arrested, uh, by the, when the coup d'etat happened in August of 91, uh, and he was put under house arrest. <laughs> oh, thank you, I was gonna do that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and these reactionary coup leaders were in charge of all the Soviet troops and all the, uh, the Soviet Air Force. Uh, 10,000 Soviet citizens came out to surround the, their White House, where their elected Russian parliament was. And when the troops had orders to come and shoot, and destroy the, the, the White House, the Parliament building, they were met by these women and 10,000 people saying, you are our, our sons and our brothers and our children, don't shoot. And they offered them you know, food and cigarettes and, uh, and these tanks turned around <laughs> and did not shoot. <coughs> so um, at any rate, and, and the same with the Air Force, they were ordered to come and shoot and saw these thousands of people in what they call the living ring surrounding the White House, and they refused to shoot. And after three days and nights, the coup leaders gave up. So it was an exa another example of people power. Right, in the 80s, this was in the 80s. Uh, it was, it was um, 91, 91, before the end of the Soviet Union. So other questions, comments? What are you going to do in Syria? Well, uh, it's seen as too dangerous for internationals to be there right now. I mean, you can get uh, kidnapped and then <laughs> they'll try to get ransom and so forth. <clears throat> but um, I think what the nonviolent peace force has been doing in helping protect civilian populations in other uh, war zones, conflict areas. Um, uh, in, the, in the UN structures, you know, in the broader community, they have seen that, that this is, these are effective ways for protecting civilians. So uh, we have an office uh, now in Lebanon, in Beirut, and have identified, I think, people from 50 areas of Syria from civil society who have different kind of political perspectives, but all of whom are committed to trying to protect civilians. So they'll be coming out to Lebanon to get training uh, by nonviolent Peace Force people um, on some of those techniques and go back and then we'll be in regular touch with them and every, I don't know, several months getting people back together, or representatives of the different groups to look at what's working and what's not working and mm. how do we strengthen this. Mm. So it's, it's just beginning, so. So you're actually training people, Syrian? Syrian people, yeah. Because you as a foreigner can probably not go. Yeah. But it's quite amazing to have uh, UN bodies saying unarmed civilian protection is uh, is, can be more effective than armed intervention. Other comments? I have a question I got writing about, and probably could answer parts of it. Uh, is there sort of a, uh, uh, you talked about 
clear training and techniques for people mm -hmm. to behave in a nonviolent context or in a nonviolent way in whatever context. Uh, is there such a is there are there nine books or is there one general thing? What 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 do you mean when you say training people for nonviolence? Is there sort of a standard way that you personally or your organization does this training? You mean you're talking about nonviolent peace force training or just training anything? But what well, yeah. I just don't I don't know. Well, there's, there's hundreds of great uh, nonviolent training manuals. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a different training uh, if you're talking about doing something like our sit-ins <laughs> or doing you know, nonviolent uh, action to challenge injustice. Uh, and a lot of that includes role playing. I mean, one is studying the history of, of nonviolent you know, movements. And do you have a copy of A Force More Powerful here? No, I don't think so. But um, if, I will try to get you a copy. But this, this has been shown on PBS television nationally here. And it's six examples of um, powerful nonviolent movements uh, in the last 50 years. Gandhi in India, the sit-ins in the south of the United States, Nonviolent resistance to Hitler in Denmark that saved most of the lives, most of the Jewish people's lives there uh, during the war, and solidarity movement in Poland. <laughs> uh, the nonviolent transformation of South Africa, which everybody said it's impossible. <laughs> it's going to just be a massive bloodbath. And then the nonviolent overthrow of Pinochet. But anyway, I think people need to see these films and get inspired about, you know, what's possible. So, um, and then in terms of nonviolent, uh, what's called third party nonviolent intervention. So it's not either party in conflict, it's, it's a third party. Um, that, al that also includes looking at the um, history and examples of what other people have done uh, what worked and what didn't work. And I think it's still on our website. Uh, we, we, uh, George Lakey, a friend of ours, developed a training curriculum, which, which is on our website. Um, but, uh, and then the, of course there's role playing and, uh, and the, there's examples in real life, but hearing some of these stories where I think in South Sudan there's been examples. Maybe you have them at the top of your head. And but where where uh, armed people came uh, ready to kill a, a bunch of local uh, South Sudanese people, and the nonviolent peace force people says, you know, I'm not you know, you know, not unless we you know we're going to be in your way. Uh, and one of the stories I didn't tell was in the Philippines, uh, where we were invited by the Philippine Council of Churches a few years ago. There were 600 civilians in a church hall uh, being threatened with, with uh, being killed by the death squads. And uh, we heard about it and went to the Catholic bishop. And he was in tears about uh, where can these people go? They've suffered so much. And we shared experience of, in Central America of Peace Brigades International and Witness for Peace. And his eyes lit up and he said, that's what we'll do. We will invite international religious people to come and be present. So uh, we faxed something out to as many groups as we could. And within uh, two and a half days, we had 25 international religious people in that church hall. Uh, and had a press conference addressing the death squads saying, uh, we appeal to you not to carry through on your threat to treat these people as children of God and your brothers and sisters, uh, but we want you to know that we're going to be here with them. And uh, also, whatever, whatever, so whatever you do to them, you have to do to us. And also, we're going to tell the whole world. 
Well, they decided <laughs> not to carry through on their, their threats. Um, and I mean, that's part of the power that we have. Yeah, it's very impressive. And thank you very much for talking. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Um, locally, Western Mass AFSC provides mm. nonviolent training mm. for um, various campaigns. Right now, they're doing workshops for people who are concerned about the uh, Tennessee gas pipeline mm -hmm. who uh, want to be prepared Good. if that's happening. So um, AFSC is a resource. Mm -hmm. And the, the training, hard to get from a book. You yeah. need to have the, the interaction and the opportunity to role play. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah. And what's impressed me is that this isn't just going on here, but all around. All around, the world. yeah. And yes. when they have a vacancy and they want a new peace worker, 15 people apply who have already been trained wow. in their home settings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. And people are um, protesting at drone bases right. around the country. My wife and I were arrested at a drone base out in California, which, I mean, as you know, people press a button on a computer and, and the bomb gets released somewhere over in Afghanistan or Iraq or... This is the, supposedly the new kind of war where no Americans will have to die. Uh, so, it, I mean, I think the Pentagon hopes that people won't be so opposed to it, you know, if no Americans are dying. Yes? In, in the case of uh, Syria, I think you said something about going to Syria. It's such a complicated case because of various governments are involved, not just people in the church. Right. And so you've got ISIS, and you've got Syrian Assad, and you've got Putin, and you've got uh, Kerry, and God knows how many other people, and <laughs> the Kurds. I mean, how would you go about it there? I mean, that's, that's, that's the highest level. Well, uh, there are, there are nonviolent ways to deal with what's happening in Syria, I think. And that includes, I mean, President Obama has said there's no military solution. <laughs> you know, and he's right. You know, and General McChrystal, who was the commander in Afghanistan, said uh, every, every drone strike we do creates more terrorists. You know, so it, it's, and the United States has created Al-Qaeda and it's created ISIS. You know, it's been our policies of killing uh, mostly civilians. I mean, it's not that that was our purpose, <laughs> but that's been the consequence. Every civilian that we kill probably has 40 to 50 relatives, friends, and here this country from the other side of the world who call themselves Christian <laughs> you know, has been bombing and killing their friends. Well, I mean, if that was happening in the United States, we probably have thousands of people recruiting to, you know, let's go and get them. Well, uh, so, uh, we, one, we need to stop these wars ourselves. The military bases in what they call their holy countries. I mean, the, the, the Muslim home, homeland. Second, uh, all parties involved including Assad, including Russia, including Iran, including you know, Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the United States, ISIS, need to sit down and say, let's, let's have a chance to hear from everybody. <laughs> what are your concerns? And I, how do we find a resolution to this, which is not going to be endless war for the next, as long as there's any people there to kill. Uh, and there are other nonviolent. So that's what, do you know this? Did you see, have any of you seen the film Pray the Devil Back to Hill, Hell? It's, it's a great film. Have you seen it, Dan? It's about Liberia. Uh, and the, 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 uh, there was a war between the government, quite dictatorial, and kind of armed gangs, whatever you want to call them, for years, and the people taking the, the brunt of that. And finally, the women from all the you know, sectors of the society 
came and uh, said, look, all of you leaders sit down at the table and negotiate a solution or else. And they finally started, they came and, and started talking. But then they talk, 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 not doing anything. So then the women said, you know, you're not getting out of this room until you make a, <laughs> you, 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 you end this war. And um, they even threatened to take off their clothes. The women? The women, which in that society is the most terrible thing that can happen to the men. You know, to see all these, you know, women without clothes. And they came to an agreement. And that now they have a, a woman president, you know, and the, the war is ended. It's an example of what, of people power, <laughs> where, you know, these governments and armed forces, it's armed groups, are, you know, vying for their, you know, greed and power and all this stuff. And these women say, no, <laughs> quit it, <laughs> you know, and they mean it and are willing to risk something themselves. Um, I was in the midst of saying something before that. But, uh, oh, the other nonviolent way of dealing, I think, with Syria is thousands of people from around the world are being recruited into ISIS, are voluntarily joining that struggle, because they see what is happening, you know, to Muslim people in country after country after country by the Christian <laughs> Crusades, as Bush once said, uh, and what's happening to the Palestinian people, you know, with total U.S. support. So, um, and most of those people are coming in through Turkey. Well, Turkey is the U.S. ally. Uh, I mean, there's Turkey, or you know, with their supporters, could close that border. Yeah, so people couldn't couldn't cross that border and go in and be ISIS uh, fighters, and could also close the border, the the oil, which is in, in ISIS-controlled areas, goes you know goes across that border, and then they've got you know millions of dollars to continue fighting their war. Well, that could be stopped, you know. Um, so these are ways which are not going to kill anybody, but uh, it could it, it could uh, stop the fueling of both money and uh, people, you know, money and um, for for the all the uh, ammunition and bombs, et cetera, but also of the soldiers. So that all these things together. I mean, it's not that the war would end tomorrow, probably, but at least it's going to begin to address some of the root causes. So uh, anyway, uh, if these stories have been helpful or inspiring to you, my book is available. It's 20 bucks, or if you can't afford that, whatever you can afford. And if you don't have money, uh, if you get it to end, <laughs> at some point, I'll... Uh, she can get the, the funds on to me. But I've got a few copies of the book. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.